Good afternoon. I'm Larry Williams. I'm going to uh, moderate this session and uh, I'm coming to you from the central time zone of Florida. So it's 12 noon, but it's one o'clock in the rest of the state and starting time for this session. So let me introduce our speaker. And there'll be time hopefully for questions. After she's done. Our speaker is Brooke Moffis. Brooke is the commercial horticulture and Florida friendly landscaping agent with UF IFAS Extension in Lake County. She recently began her PhD studies with the UF IFAS School of Natural Resources and Environment. Before her employment with Extension, she managed integrated pest management operations for the land pavilion at Epcot. What a cool job. It she was. <laughs> earned her bachelor's in horticulture from Tennessee Tech and her master's in entomology and nematology from the University of Florida. Brooke credits her love of plants and creatures to her to gardening with her grandfather as a teenager. And again, you can enter your questions in the chat box and we'll kind of go over those as we can at the end of Brooke's presentation. I'm looking forward to this. The topic is ground covers as lawn and other Florida friendly landscaping trends. Brooke, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Larry. I'm always glad to be with Master Gardener volunteers. I um, am now a commercial horticulture agent, but previously I worked with Master Gardeners for about 14 years in Lake and in Sumter County. So I'm actually going to present a little bit to you today about some of the PhD research. And when Larry said that in the introduction, I took a deep breath because I'm only two months in and I'm trying to figure out how the heck I'm going to do this. But anyhow, <laughs> I'm going to give it, you know, my best shot and uh, we're having a lot of fun and, and doing some cool projects already. So let me go ahead. So the agenda, we're going to talk about this multi-species lawn research project. We're going to cover some current and potential ground cover species. And then I'm going to have some fun and we're just going to talk about some trends that I'm seeing out there in the landscape industry, uh, maybe some trends that like Better Homes and Gardens and you know some of these other garden magazines and blogs are picking up on too. So we'll spend some time talking about ornamental grasses, composting, grazing or noshing. So I'll explain that one in a little bit. This is me getting a little weird on you. And then I'll get into naturalistic design and elements. But first, let's talk about this multi-species lawn research project. And you might be wondering what in the world is she talking about? Or some of you may already think, hey, I'm ahead of the game. I already have a multi-species lawn. So we'll explore that. So one of the reasons why this is an important area to explore is that, you know, we have just this rapid expanse of residential and low density housing. In 2019, this was the last figure that I saw. But in 2019, 900 residents moved to Florida every single day or, you know, on average. Uh, it may be even more than that now. So this land use of low density houses with these yards and, you know, uh, just hundreds and thousands of houses is 26% of U.S. land area right now. So what happens when we have all this coverage with these impervious surfaces and these homes? You know, we've got to have it, right? Because we have folks moving here. Well, we displace wildlife when we do that. And that's an area that I'm, um, you know, passionate about. We take agricultural lands, sometimes crop lands, sometimes natural lands, and then we convert them over to, you know, this type of housing situation. So, so some of the questions that we want to ask in um, our research group is how can we design, construct, and manage residential and urbanizing landscapes to support wildlife and to support biodiversity. And it's funny because you get different takes from different people. Uh, my family is from rural Tennessee and they were scratching their heads like, why would we even want to attract wildlife? But I think they were thinking of some of the nuisance wildlife, you know, and if you're going to attract wildlife, you're going to attract all of it, right? Or, you know, theoretically, I guess. So we're wanting to attract birds and pollinators and those types of things, but we might get the occasional snake as well. So you can't be too choosy. All right, so study objectives. This is what we wanted to do with our multi-species lawn project, and you're getting a sneak peek here. We wanted to see if mixing wildflowers in a lawn would help with lawn resiliency. And we measured resiliency by measuring the percent green coverage in that lawn. Uh, we also were looking at other forms of biodiversity. So yeah, we're increasing the biodiversity in these uh, wildflower lawns, if you will. 
and we want to see if it's going to increase pollinators or increase some of those ground dwelling insects and arthropods. We wanted to also measure homeowner perception because if people hate it, it's not going to happen <laughs> no matter how many insects it attracts. And then we wanted to look at feasibility as well. Like, is this a practical thing to do? So we're not completely done. We haven't analyzed all the data, but I'm going to share with you where we are so far in the process because it's been really interesting. So this is what our experiment uh, design looks like. We have uh, three different treatments. In treatment one, we have Bahia grass alone. In treatment two, we have Bahia grass. It's the one with the mower. We have Bahia grass mixed with wildflowers. And in treatment three, we have wildflowers only. Now you may see the word Forbes on some of these slides. Forbes is, you can almost think of it as another term for wildflower in a sense. It was a new term to me. We didn't use it in horticulture, but now that I'm doing some ecology type studies, uh, that's the term that's typically used. So these are the Forbes we selected. We selected Mimosa strigulosa, which is sunshine mimosa, Salvia lyrata, which is the uh, smaller growing uh, sage plant, we also did Phyla notiflora, which is frog fruit, and then we mixed in uh, Leavenworth's tick seed or Coreopsis leavenworthi into these lawns to see what would happen. Oh, we picked these um, flowers because they are ones that we thought would reseed in a Bahia type situation. You know, Bahia tends to have an open habit, so we thought that they would reseed, and we thought that they might be mowable, but we found some things out. Some were, some were not. All right, so what we did with these plots is we irrigated them to establish them and then we turned that irrigation off because we're trying to pretend that we are in the worst water management situation to where we cannot water at all. Um, now, I have to admit though, we got really droughty during this experiment and we did have to water about three times um, because we were afraid we might actually lose the plots. But three times in a year and a half is a lot better than once a week, right? Or once every two weeks. So. We spent hours weeding these plots initially when we established them. We had so much weed competition that we thought nobody's going to do this. So we have to rethink how we establish these plots. We ended up weeding monthly for 15 minutes each plot. Again, a lot of folks aren't going to do that, but you know, hey, we're in the experimental phase. We're trying to figure this out. We did not fertilize them. We did not apply pesticides or herbicides. And then we mowed them differently too. So Bahia got a once a week mowing the Bahia only plots, the blended plots where we had Bahia mixed with wildflowers, we did every other week mowing. And then with the wildflowers only plots, we only mowed them as needed, which was not frequently at all. So again, the things we wanted to measure is we wanted to measure the public perception, um, resiliency, again, that's that percent green coverage. We wanted to look at pollinator visits. So we actually would count the number of times a pollinator would land on a flower. And the same pollinator could be counted repeatedly. It could lift off that flower, land again, and that would be counted as a separate visit because we wanted to explore, or I guess you could say, um, find out what pollinator activity would be. So then we looked at arthropod abundance and we wanted to see how in the world would you even manage these blended systems? So we again, we learned a lot with our pollinator visitation. It, it's really as what you would expect um, with Bahia grass. You know, we had um, we actually if they landed on a Bahia seed uh, stock, we would count that as a visit. So we did have a just very slight uh, number of pollinator visitations. And then with Bahia grass and Forbes, as soon as we started mixing those wildflowers in, of course, we ended up with um, more pollinator visits. And we didn't measure the amount, we didn't measure each individual species. We grouped these pollinators into larger groups like honeybees and carpenter bees and butterflies and moths and wasp. So in our Bahia grass and Forbes mixture, we had the most activity um, from butterflies and moths. And in our Forbes, which is our wildflower only plots, we had, you know, the most activity from wasp actually. So why would we want to attract wasp? Well, they can be important for that food web too, and they can be pollinators as well. So, uh, but you can see how that increase of pollinator activity increased with the amount of wildflowers that we added to the plots. Um, these are pitfall traps, and this is box plots. I'm just learning how to look at box plots right now. Um, but anyway, let me explain what a pitfall trap is. It's this little tube, or sometimes it's a dish that entomologists will put in the, 
to the ground and we just wait basically for insects to fall into it. And so we left these pitfall traps out for about five days, I believe, and then we would collect them and count and try to figure out what types of insects landed in it. So in this um, experiment, we saw more herbivores. So these are insects that eat plants in the wildflower only plots. So that is the red box plot that you see here. So we had more herbivores. And why would we want to have herbivores, right? Well, we're trying to increase biodiversity and that means you're going to get some chewing marks in your leaves as well. One of our plants that we had was frog fruit. And so we had a lot of caterpillar feeding on that frog fruit. Uh, so anyhow, now the grass plots, as you can imagine, we had uh, less of an abundance of different types of arthropods. And again, these are ground dwelling arthropods herbivores. Now we saw no difference in any other arthropod communities. So there was no difference in predatory insects. Uh, there were no difference in some of those insects that shred and break down things. So, you know, I thought that was an interesting observation there. So again, our only difference really was herbivores, uh, those that feed on plants. All right, so this is what our plots looked like at different times of the year, and it was very seasonal, I have to tell you. Uh, when What we experienced is when we had the forbs mixed in, uh, we had about a 5 to 20 percent higher percent green coverage than we did with the Bahia grass plots alone uh, during the summertime. But during the winter, it was a totally different story. So we had about 30 percent higher percent green coverage with Bahia grass in the winter time. So um, it was interesting to see that seasonal change. And so are there things that we can do, um, you know, to mix these species so that we get a decent percent green coverage throughout the year? So I thought that was interesting. Uh, towards the end of the study, the cover was highest, percent green cover was highest um, in the mixed plots. So, so really we found out that forbs and grass contribute to different green coverage throughout times of the year. Well, why is green coverage important? Well, it's a measure of resiliency to tell us how well these plants are performing. But also, I think one of the things most people care about with their lawns is that they have green coverage. Um, some of us may even have lawns that are just green and we just mow them and there's all kinds of things planted in there and we just care that it's green. So I think that's a big concern for folks, you know, but of course, when you get into these higher end HOAs, they want a monoculture type look to the landscape. So again, here's what we found. Our plots with wildflowers demonstrated increased pollinator diversity and increased pollinator activity or visits. Um, with our arthropods, ground dwelling herbivores, again, those that feed on plants were highest in the forbs, but we had no other effects. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then again, coverage, the plots with the wildflowers were higher in the spring and the summer, and the turf grass provided more coverage in the wintertime. All right, so lessons learned is if we want to do something like this, uh, we really have to think about winter dormancy. You can see the bottom picture there. That's one of our master gardeners. Oh, and master gardeners were instrumental in this whole project, I have to say. Um, so they uh, they helped us collect data. They helped us, helped us set up the plots. So thank you, Lake County Master Gardeners, for all your work on this. Uh, but anyhow, you can see the winter dormancy, and even the Bahia grass seems to go a little bit dormant in the winter, um, at least when we're, uh, and it does when we're dry and droughty too. So, but you can see the Bahia grass plots look better than our mixed plots or our wildflowers alone plots. Um, so, but look at them in the summer totally different story, right? Everything looks nice and lush and green in all of the plots when we're re receiving that adequate rainfall. All right, so another thing we have to think about if we want to explore this is better weed suppression. Maybe we need to experiment with some pre-emergent herbicides that we put down. You know, maybe we install the wildflowers mixed with these turf grasses and then we um, put a pre-emergent herbicide that is going to keep weed seeds at bay, at bay initially but then fade, you know, maybe three to six months later so these wildflowers can reseed. So that's one thought. Um, or maybe we need to plant our wildflowers almost like a sod. I just wanted to show you this picture too. This is from June 7th of this, this past year, and we were really, really dry and droughty. And so you can see the Bahia grass alone is on the left. Uh, it's we were just starting to get summer rains return on June 7th, which is pretty typical for Central Florida um, early June. So you can see they're starting to return. They were actually completely brown. And then we have our Forbes only. Again, that's our wildflowers only plots in the top right. And you can see how they were performing 
June 7th, but check it out. Here's our blended plot. This is our Bahia grass blended with some of these wildflowers and the coverage is outstanding compared to the other plots. So I really think there's something going on with the root systems of these plants to where they're holding more moisture in the soil. Um, you know, maybe they're more distributed throughout the soil because you've got all these different species. So something's going on there and I want to explore that a little further too. But I was impressed with the um, percent green coverage from the blended plots. All right, but I also want to show you what they look like at different times of year. This was the wildflowers only plot. So in this case, we're kind of growing a meadow, right? And this might be a little too unkempt for some people, although there was a small percentage of our group that uh, did appreciate this. So, you know, if you're into more of a meadow thing, this is late winter. I would say this is late February, um, early March time period. So that's what that looked like. So I just want to give you guys some different perspectives because they did change quite a bit seasonally. So, you know, moving forward, we're going to try to figure out this this weeding pressure issue because no one could weed as much as we weeded and it, it be successful, um, you know, long term. So that's one of the things we want to look at is how do we address the weed pressure? We want to select more low growing and flowering plants to study. We need to determine the best management pro practices if uh, we do want to move forward with some of these mixed plots and, you know, we do need to analyze that perception. We do not have the perception data analyzed yet, so I don't have that to share with you so far. Um, and then we need to see if there's commercial interest. And so far there has been some commercial interest, uh, at least in Lake County. Green Isle Gardens, which is a native plant nursery, has developed their own wildflower sod. And they may have been thinking of this before they saw our research um, plots, but they did come out and tour and, you know, and they're working on on this. So I thought that was interesting. And then there's also a large tree farm in our area that is uh, working more with these different types of ground covers. So there is some interest there from the commercial industry, which is pretty cool. All right, so I'm going to get into other ground covers, but this was our team, Dr. Basil Iannone. He was an ecologist with a school of forest fisheries and geomatic sciences, so that's a mouthful. Um, this is one of the graduate students, Augustine, and I can't remember poor Augustine's last name, but anyway, he's with Dr. Brian Unruh, who's one of our turf specialists. And we have Carol um, over here too. She was on the team, Carol Hoffman, Lake County Master Gardener, Jack Pounders, who's another Lake County Master Gardener, and John Braun. Lake County Master Gardener Crandall May as well, and then Ron Musgrave, who's our technician, and you all know this lady over here, Wendy Wilbur, but we had even more people on the team. Dr. Sandy Wilson was on the team, Dr. Adam Dale, and this, um, who's an entomologist, and this little project really inspired me to kind of move forward with my studies, um, you know, and, and who knows, let's see what cool things we can do. All right, so let's go on to ground covers as lawns. You know, I kind of talked about this multi-species thing, which is new, but interesting, and it's, you know, it got some interest, that's for sure. So let's talk about some other ground covers. I wanted to talk to you for a minute about different type, types of lawn traits. These are the things we look for in our lawns. Um, you know, typically we want that uniform green, right? We want green, we want that resiliency, we want it to be tough. Uh, we want to use it for recreation, erosion control, turf grasses are used for, uh, filtration, if you fertilize them appro appropriately, they can be a good filter of nutrients. Uh, you're able to mow it, right? And then it's tolerant of foot traffic too. And then we want low inputs or maybe even no inputs for water usage, fertilizer, and pesticides. So we always want to stick to the Florida-friendly recommendations, right? So we don't end up leaching nutrients into our water bodies. And we can keep that turf grass healthy so it can actually serve as a filter too. But I want to show you all this. Um, this is my backyard, and it is a bitter blue St. Augustine grass. And uh, guess how much I water this? Guess how much I fertilize it? Larry, is there anything coming in on the chat? I actually want you guys to chat and, and give me a guess. How often do I water and fertilize this bitter blue St. Augustine grass in my backyard? See if anybody's chatting in there. Got any chatters out there? Okay, if not, that's okay. I'll keep going on. Never, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, once a month, not very often, never. I. It looks oh. like it's getting some water to me, but <laughs> you know it's not. But you know, you guys, if you can look a little bit further, we have this big stormwater pond in the backyard. Um, 
I'll tell you the situation that happened to me is uh, our irrigation system kept getting clogged um, because it was pulling off of this stormwater pond. The house was built in the 70s. And so anyway, my husband and I have spent one too many three day weekends trying to, you know, get our irrigation up to speed. And so after spending a whole Memorial Day weekend working on irrigation, it just it went out like two or three weeks later and we said the heck with it. So we quit irrigating. So this is Mother Nature. Occasionally, if we get really droughty, I might bring out an oscillating sprinkler although I did not even do that this year at all. Um, and then uh, we don't, I think we fertilized it with milorganite maybe 10 years ago. And I think he treated it for chinch bugs once in all these years. So we mow it at the right height, right? We mow it at that four inch level for St. Augustine grass for this type of cultivar. And, you know, we don't rake it up. We just let it settle and it's beautiful. But again, Larry mentioned it sure looks like you water. And I think a lot of that is because we do have a stormwater pond in the back because the front yard is a totally different story. So I think this all goes with right plant and right place. About the same time our irrigation went out on us, um, we had a tree that we needed to take down in the front yard because it was getting into the drain field. And, you know, there were some other situations. So our turf grass completely died in the front yard. It could not really survive without irrigation. Again, it's bitter blue. So it's one of those St. Augustine that performs well in shade. So I ended up going in with Sunshine Mimosa. Um, and actually, I think it looks quite well during certain times of year. So what I have noticed with um, some of these ground covers is they can look, or at least with mimosa, is it can look really good when we're really droughty. But once we start getting the summer rains, we'll start getting lots of weed competition in there. But it's okay because at that point it's green and I mow it and it's fine. So anyway, but I did want to show you guys, hey, I can do a lawn all day long in my backyard, a turf grass lawn, but I've, I'm doing something else in the front yard. It's um, better suited. We do have it mixed in with bahia grass now too. So we do have turf grass in the front mixed in with a mimosa. So guess what? My little research project I'm doing at work, I've been doing it at home. <laughs> so some of you may have been doing that too. All right, so let's jump into some of these different species. Twin flower. This one is not mowable, um, but it can make a really nice ground cover. And I think it is highly underutilized. I have been absolutely thrilled with this plant. We planted it in Discovery Gardens in 2018. It does well in sandy, well-drained soil. It's going to perform best in full sun. You'll get these little purple flowers on it. But we grew it at the Sumter County Extension Office, and it performed quite nicely in part shade. With watering, it likes it dry to moist. Uh, but it can be very drought tolerant once it's established. So, and then propagation is seeds and, and cuttings or division. You can do all of those things. Um, we do not have to weed this plot. The coverage is so good and thick. Uh, when we started though, I will say we had no weeds in that bed. It's um, a little demonstration area where we have ground covers and turf grass and we make sure everything, you know, is, is cleaned out ahead of time. So we had no weed competition, which was good, but very, very nice, very underutilized. Uh, I grabbed this information actually from um, Florida Native Plant Society member, and she's a Pasco Master Gardener. So if Peggy Gretchen is on here, kudos, because you had an excellent article on this where you had very solid references. So thank you for posting that. Um, I threw up this page on Google Scholar. Because when I was, when Wendy asked me to do something on just ground covers in general for you all, or ground covers as lawns, um, I actually went into Google Scholar. I wanted to see what the research was. And these are the types of articles that I saw. Plant response following soil disturbance in a longleaf pine ecosystem. That was one of the hits. Another hit, ground cover recovery patterns and life history traits. Implications for restoration obstacles and opportunities and species rich savanna. Um, and then this is where I found the, uh, I think the article uh, was from a Nature Coast newsletter. But anyhow, uh, you can see that there's really nothing that is referencing it in a landscape, landscape type situation. So a lot of the information I'm going to tell you today and a lot of the information that I found online is more observational. Uh, we just don't have the research as far as how to maintain these things um, in a home landscape. But we do have observational information. We have information from Florida Native Plant Society. But again, not a lot of research-based information on these plants. And I saw someone typed in the chat. They asked how tall is 
twin flower, I would say about six inches tall, six to eight inches tall, somewhere around there. Um, and you don't even have to mow it. It's great. I love it. And so here is another species of twin flower. This one is swamp twin flower, uh, Dicaristi humistrata. I just think it's a fun scientific word, um, but it grows in the full to part sun. It likes a moderately moist soil, but it, it can do, you know, a, a decently drained soil too. Um, these do spread by runners, but it's not as aggressive as, um, you know, some of the mimosas and some of these other ground covers that I'm talking about today. So um, the, the, the claim is that this is an annual to short-lived perennial, but we'll see in landscape settings. It's also a larval plant for the common buckeye too. Um, and then this one can take a little bit of shade. I just saw someone say, how about a ground cover for shade? This one in the twin flower I just showed you all, the other twin flower, um, those can both do a little bit of shade, especially the previous one. Actually, let me go back to it real quick. Oblongfolia, that one can take some shade. And it's really nice, but I'll get to some other shade lovers too. All right, frog fruit or Phyllanotiflora. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because you, as master gardeners, and if you have an interest on it, attending this talk, you know about frog fruit, I am sure. It likes a moist or moderately dry soil, so it can do almost any soil moisture type. Um, not real drought, droughty soils, but moderately dry. It can take full sun to part shade. This one's growing in my lawn on its own too. Um, you can propagate it by division and cuttings. And it's an adult and larval butterfly plant for the Phaon Crescent, the common buckeye, and the white peacock. So as someone that studied entomology, that's super important to me. What type of insect species can these um, plants provide for? What we call it ecosystem services. Um, you know, and people forget we've got to have the insects so that we can have higher life forms too we've got to have the insects so that we have the birds to prey upon them. So if you like songbirds in your yard, plant for the insects. It goes against a lot of what we've been taught over the years, um, but this is a trend. So here is a beautiful native landscape, and this is in the Villages, Florida. And if you look at the ground cover that's low to the ground in the front, that is frog fruit. They did tell me that they watered it about twice a week though. So, you know, um, could they water it less? Maybe, but we just don't have the research, research out there right now. And it's all going to depend too. And then we have um, Mimosa strigillosa, another fun scientific name to say. Sunshine Mimosa, full sun to part shade. It gets a little bit leggier in the shade. It is mowable, but not necessary. And I came up with the word mowable. I thought that was an actual word. It's not. So anyway, maybe some of you use it too. Uh, can't, it's seasonal coverage. It's going to go down on you when it gets out competed by other weeds in the summertime and it's going to go down on you if we get any kind of cold snap or frost but it performs beautifully when we're droughty and will out compete everything else when we're droughty so weed management's important too um with sunshine and most in a lot of these ground covers uh and then I, of course i have to talk about a perennial peanut if i'm going to do a ground cover talk right uh arachis globo Labrata. This one is not native, um, but it's pretty hardy and, you know, it actually fixes nitrogen, so there's no need to fertilize. And actually, a lot of these ground covers, you don't need to fertilize. Uh, it will suffer some freeze damage, like sun to part shade. I thought this was cool. This is at the Apopka Research Center, the Mid-Florida um, Research and Education Center, and they were keeping it maintained in their lawn very low, but they were raising that mower blade, or I guess not mowing it, and probably just weed uh, string trimming it around the sign, and I thought that was kind of a cute idea. So anyhow, just make sure with these ground covers that you do a good job either solarizing or using some herbicides to kill off the weeds that are already there. The undesirables, I should say. Then Asiatic Jasmine, this is another one that you probably all know as Master Gardeners, but I feel like it must have a place in a talk on ground covers. Again, as the name implies, it is not um, a native species, but very tough. This is also in the villages too. And I have lots of pictures of the villages um, because uh, there has actually been a group that's really worked with their architectural review committee to get uh, some of these yards with more plantings, more ground covers, and replacing some of their turf grass. So I just think it's an interesting trend. All right, so uh, with this, a lot of people don't realize you really only have to mow it once a year, but you got to time it perfect. You've got to time it before it flushes out. 
Uh, so I would say in Central Florida, we're looking at probably late February or early March. And then it can take some, um, you know, occasional edging just to keep it in bounds. The first year, the recommendation is about four times a year. And after that, you're going to fertilize once in the spring when it starts to flush out um, every other year. So, and this is according to Dr. Gary Knox, who I always love to listen to uh, Dr. Knox. He's always full of information and he often speaks at the Master Gardener conferences. So anyhow, um, is it walkable? No, is it mowable? No, but it's still a nice ground cover in places where we don't have to walk and we don't have to mow and we don't have little pets. All right, here's a new one for you all. I, I bet it's new for most of you. Salvia my, micella. The common name is tropical sage, but we know the issues with common names. There's a lot of tropical sages out there. So um, this one, I'm just going to call it by its scientific name, Salvia micella. Um, this one is great if you have an area that is um, maybe surrounded by a sidewalk or some other type of barrier, barrier because even though this is a native, it's a very aggressive native. And I have had it actually outcompete some of my other ground covers here at Discovery Gardens in Tavares. So um, I actually am thinking, even though I'm telling you all about this plant, I'm thinking about ripping it all out because I just have such a hard time weeding it. So that should tell you that it reseeds very heavily. Um, okay, so someone said that the Salvia Micella's uh, uh, name is Creeping Sage. So, but it's also called tropical sage as well. Uh, but there's other tropical sages, right, uh, that are out there. So, uh, it does form a dense stand. Uh, but like I said, I, I find that it's an aggressive native, and it, it does attract the hair streak butterfly. Is it walkable? No. Is it mowable? Probably not. Um, so, a lot of this information I got from the native Florida Native Plant Society. Dichondra. Here's one that can grow in the shade. Um, you guys have probably seen this in your yard before and just chalked it up to being a, a weed. It gets maybe just one or two inches tall. People call it pony foot. Uh, they actually use it in Southern California already as a ground cover. And again, it can take some light shade to full sun. And it usually performs a little bit better in wet to well-drained soil. So it's not going to take a real droughty soil. But this is funny because this is what our one of our Discovery Gardens plots looks like where we have examples of different types of ground covers and turf. And in here, it's mixed Bahia and Dichondra together. And it was really funny because uh, one of our garden techs said, oh my goodness, we need to pull this all out. Look at that. And I thought, you know what? Let's not pull it out. Let's make it easy on ourselves and let's just call it a Dichondra Bahia grass blend. So we actually put a sign up there that said Dichondra Bahia blend <laughs> and we're going with it because it's green and it looks great. So anyhow, um, you can propagate this by division uh, or, or, you know, because it has those creeping stems. So, and I found very little information about growing this as a ground cover. Some of you folks that really like a high maintenance landscape or are into turf grass, you're probably cringing that I am mentioning this. So I am, um, let me back up a little bit. For this one, I'm not necessarily recommending it because we haven't really studied it hardly at all. There's very little information out there about it, but it is um, a native to the Eastern coastal area. Um, and, you know, it seems to be performing quite well, so we'll see where it goes, but that's a potential. Here's one that is really dicey, folks. This one is Desmodium triflorum, three flower beggar weed, and this is going to be a common weed in your turf and your open pine woods area, so it will go to disturbed habitats. This is not a native. Um, turf grass folks would probably pull their hair out knowing that I'm even entertaining the thought of this <laughs> but when I see it growing out sometimes even in our natural areas or in our turf grasses it forms a really nice mat and I think it can look quite lovely so the jury is still out on this um, it does produce little purple flowers and little tiny fruits too and it's a, again it's a perennial it does pop up in our natural areas you know and it was funny because my director is a livestock extension agent her name's meg brew but anyway she came by my office and she goes you're not going to talk about that are you and then she said you know what actually when i see it in all the pastures that i go to she's like the the um it's a, not a harmful plant and it's not you know i don't observe it as being really aggressive so then she kind of changed her mind after we started talking about it you know so i thought that was kind of interesting all right so 
um, we're beyond the ground covers. Now I just want to briefly go over some other FFL trends for you. Wendy asked me to talk about this as well, and I'm happy to, but I have to tell everyone I was really stumped on this. Um, I'm like, what FFL trends am I going to talk about that they haven't already heard a million times? And some of these you have heard. Um, but, you know, it was funny because I just started going through a couple websites just to see what the 2021 garden trends were. And then I just started going through my phone because, I, you know, being in horticulture since I was a teenager, something has to really catch my eye to make me stop and take a picture of it in the plant world. So I thought, well, maybe my I'm, I'm about to give you guys a photo dump is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so maybe my phone and the things that I pick up on and the things that are trending in Lake County are also trending in other places. And after I checked some of these websites like the Bob Villa, he had a web uh, garden trends, Better Homes and Garden did. There was a couple other places too that had garden trends mentioned 2021 and a lot of them were I was on point. So I'm like, cool, I can share this with the master gardeners now. Um, and some of the things were things like sustainable, sustainable landscaping that's getting more attention now. Um, and we're talking about water usage, right? We're talking about decreasing inputs, right? So those are some of the things. Um, other things are just attracting more wildlife and biodiversity, which is cool. I feel like we're, you know, on a trend here. But then there's some other trends I'm going to talk to you all about as well. All right, so ornamental grasses wildflower pollinator gardens i call them grazing or noshing landscapes and i'll explain what that is in a minute rain gardens compost and we're doing compost before we install landscapes now and before we do big turf installs and a lot of that is due to extension agent efforts and university of florida specialist efforts so that's pretty cool and then i'm going to just go over some really beautiful naturalistic landscapes so hopefully you all are ready to look at some pretty pictures for the next little bit all right, so again, I'm going to be very general here because I've got about 10 more minutes to go over these trends. All right, so I wanted to show you all this because I thought this is just an inspiring scene here. This is at Peter's Meadow in Pear Park. And this is, Peter is a volunteer with Lake County and he volunteered with Pear Park, which is in Leesburg. And he planted all of these by hand, all of these grasses that you see. So he planted over the years, this entire meadow. And I think it's quite striking. But then when I go to other places like Bach Tower Gardens, um, I see these faux rocks, you know, but they look very nice and naturalistic. And then I see other clumping grasses. And, you know, I just think very lovely, very naturalistic, a high visual impact. There's, you can have grass, ornamental grasses that are wispy and fine textured. You can have more structural ornamental grasses too that really demand your attention. Grasses can either be clump forming or they can be creeping. And there's always the debate around pruning ornamental grasses. And I don't know that there's been a lot of research conducted on that either. So do you even need to prune those ornamental grasses? Well, if they're self shedding, then no, you can actually just wait for the older leaves to die back and you can pull them out. I would suggest wearing some heavy duty gloves and some long shirt sleeves for that too. Or if you wanna spare yourself from doing all that pulling, sometimes it comes out easily, sometimes not so much. Um, you could prune some of that old growth out. Um, so those for, are for the self shedding grasses. For some of your other ornamental grasses, the recommendation is to prune them. Um, in North and Central Florida, you want to do this around February to March. South Florida, you want to do more of January to February. But we also um, should think brown is a color too. A lot of times these ornamental grasses get pruned really, really hard in November, December because they're starting to brown out and we need to embrace brown as a color. And maybe if we do it as master gardeners and extension agents, it will catch on, I hope. <laughs> so isn't that our mission, right, to, to catch some of this on? So I grabbed this picture actually off the internet. This was from um, a website called lighthousevacations.com. I guess it's a place where you can go and book vacations. But anyway, it's the World War II Museum. Does anybody know where this is from? Just you know, this, this, that's not important. I just wondered if any of you have been here. So I recently went to St. Simon's Island here. I just told you um, in South Georgia near the coast. And this is the old World War II home front museum. And I had to get a picture of this because it was all these grassy plants. And I 
felt like it just looked beautiful in this coastal Georgia setting. So they had Dianella, which actually is not a grass, so we'll call it grass-like um, or flax lily. It's actually in the lily family. We have Gulf Muley grass, um, which is planted in abundance, we all know, because of those purple blooms. And then there were some taller grasses in the background. Um, so anyway, I just thought this landscape is almost all ornamental grass or grass-like plants, and it looks quite nice. All right, so let's talk about wildflowers and pollinator gardens. I'm seeing more of this as a trend, um, supporting the little things that run the world. Edward O. Wilson um, wrote this article. I believe he was an entomologist, and he, he wrote an article called The Little Things That Run the World uh, back in the 80s. But anyhow, just some things to keep in mind about pollination. More than 80% of flowering plants require animal pollination. An estimated one third of the food we eat comes from animal pollinated plants. Bee pollinated commodities account for about 20 billion in annual US agricultural production and 217 billion worldwide. So these are just a few facts there. Um, I actually wrote a paper one time and I started it with the famous Einstein quote, which says that if the honeybee were to become extinct, human beings would not exist in three years. So I wrote this paper and I had this quote that I had heard was from Einstein. And when I turned it in, my professor said, where did you hear that? And I was like, I, I don't know. And he's like, did you get it off of Facebook? <laughs> I said, no, but anyway, I'd heard it somewhere. And he goes, don't believe everything you hear or read because Einstein didn't say that. And if we did not have pollinators and honeybees, human beings would not go extinct. Our diets would be very bland and probably poor nutritional quality. Um, but most of our plants that we eat, or I shouldn't say most of our plants, a lot of our um, staple crops, wheat and corn and rice, they're wind pollinated. So we would definitely have carbohydrates and some nutrition, but we do need that diversity and nutrition in our diet. So don't believe everything you hear if it's on, you know, social media. I don't know where I heard it, but I used it as the start of my paper and I got a big old X. So anyhow, but I'm, they're still extremely important. Again, an estimated one third of the food we eat comes from animal pollinated plants. And by that, we mean um, our insects as well. So they're lumped into those animals there. All right, so this is my little pollinator garden that I'm trying to do in my front yard. I want it to look like a, a in a sense, like a perennial or a wildflower border. But here are just some tips. You want a wide variety of flowering plants, different heights, different shapes, different structures, uh, grow native wildflowers. Um, and then you can clump like flowers together. This causes a little bit more attention. Those butterflies and, and um, pollinators can seek those plants out easy because you've kind of clumped them together. Uh, but don't be too, um, what's the word, monoculture about it. You want to have lots of variety. All right, so you want to provide continuous blooms. For example, you want to plant things like redbud because it's a very important plant for um, honeybees and other insects pollinators over the winter and things like goldenrod you want to plant so that you have a late fall uh, food source. So think about planting for continuous bloom so that you keep those pollinators around. This is gaining attention from large scale nursery production or planting more and more native wildflower species, which I think is pretty cool. So this is a large grower in South Lake County and they've really um, dipped into the wildflower pollinator biodiversity world, I guess you could say. So I go out there occasionally to their nursery and take lots of pictures. And I believe this is lance leaved Coreopsis. All right, so let's talk about rain gardens briefly. Again, I said I was going to skim over everything, um, but I do want to show you some really cool pictures of some naturalistic landscapes at the end. Um, I actually took this picture at a truck stop on 75. It's in between Bushnell and not Bushnell, Bushnell in, um, in Tampa. So it's along that stretch of 75 and I pulled up and I had to take a picture. I'm like, oh my goodness, they have this little rain garden here and I'm not sure what the drainage situation is. It looks like there's probably a liner here and then it drains somewhere else. But my hope is that it drains somewhere that's um, pervious so that we can get some filtration there. But I thought, man, if a truck stop is doing it on 75, this has got to be a trend, right? So anyhow, I just thought it was cool. Very cool. And how pretty is that? Go truck stop. 
All right, here's some other rain gardens. Um, this is an area, this was actually in Portland, Oregon, where I took this picture between these buildings. And oh gosh, almost everywhere in Oregon, they had these little places where the water would come off of the buildings. It would drain, you know, from their gutters and it would drain or their pipes and it would drain into some type of retention area. And the, it's interesting with us, we're really concerned about nutrient filtration with our rain gardens. We want that soil to filter the water. In Portland, they were concerned about slowing down the river to reduce flooding of the Columbia River Gorge. So uh, two different concepts, um, you know, but it can slow water movement. It helps to perk and it helps to filter. And then this was just a little rain garden that I saw in a parking lot and they had an educational sign there. So love that they have these interpretive signs. Interpretive signs can be very effective for educating the public. All right, so let's talk about compost real quick too. Ah, here's the home builder special, right? This is actually in a neighborhood right next to mine and I would go walking there. Um, I actually saw where the construction workers would dig big holes and they would throw their Hardee's and McDonald's and Taco Bell or whoever, you know, whatever restaurant they were eating their fast food restaurant and they would throw the trash into this, uh, this big hole in the ground and then they would leave, you know, maybe even a piece of sheetrock down. So we, uh, you know, we've seen this story as master gardeners. We've seen it play out all through central Florida where you you have subsoil that's been dug out of this big retention pond and used for your yard and you're trying to garden in it or you have this builder sand that is brought in too. Um, this is a development where we're working on some research down in the Lake Nona area and um, we're going to help them install some uh, boundary planting, some Florida friendly, Florida friendly and native uh, boundary plantings so for this subdivision but anyway you can see what we're going to be establishing those plants in so not only is it fill soil it's soil that's been graded and it's soil that has had all of this heavy construction equipment parked on it as well so anyway this is the story right but these are some of the things that we're doing um, here in central florida to help combat this type of situation oops oh i don't think my video is going to play i'm sorry folks Oh, no. OK, so um, let me explain the situation here. We have uh, about two or three companies now that actually put compost down amendments before new sod goes down. Or if you've just had a horrible time with your sod as far as getting it to establish or just, you know, continual sod problems, um, they can come in and they'll put down about a four inch layer and, or I'm sorry, they'll put down a good solid one inch layer of compost and they'll work it into the top four inches into the soil. And so that's what this one company is doing here. So we have some very large companies, landscape companies, some that are statewide, uh, some that are throughout the Southeast that are offering this as a service now. So, so anyhow, um, and that I find that to be very inspiring. And again, this is some of the research that I was talking about that was inspired by extension agents and UFI specialists. And there are some developments that actually want to go in with compost from the very get go. So some of those developers we're getting to, right? So we're making some progress there because if we can put this compost down, the thought is maybe we can kickstart the turf building process. We give this turf a really nice good start with this nice rich organic matter. Even if the organic matter starts to fade and get degraded over time, um, you know, which it, it will get decomposed by the microbes, right? But you're gonna have this nice lush lawn that's gonna kind of help to refurbish that because you're gonna be mowing it and you're gonna be putting out healthy leaf clippings. So, and this is just a thought. So this is something that's being um, researched by De Dr. Eben Bean and his team. So anyhow, uh, with UF IFAS, and they're in the agricultural and engineering department there. So, but I just wanted to show you guys, this is happening right in Lake County. And if it's happening in Lake County, it's probably happening in lots of places, or it could happen in lots of places. So this is in Claremont. And if you're familiar with Claremont, it is a area of excessively drained sands because it's actually on ancient sand dunes. I kid you not. So it was the spine of Florida that rose from the sea initially. So anyhow, so they are gardening on ancient sand dunes and this particular development, this was actually a sand mine as well. So the residents called me in because their turf grasses were doing so poorly and they said, we're gardening on a sand mine. And I said, no, no, no. And then 
sure enough, they actually showed me the old mining equipment. And by looking at the topography of the land, you could see that it really was a sand mine. So that's what they're, you know, that's what they're gardening in. Okay, so let me go on. So this is just a kooky one that I came up with. So I didn't really see this on anybody else's radar. And I'm calling it a grazing or a noshing garden because this is something that I want to do. And I'm, um, I'm going to finish up pretty quick. But I think people um, want easy, low maintenance edibles. At least I know I do. I just don't have the time being a working woman with young children, you know, trying to manage a vegetable garden and whatnot. So I'm looking for very easy to grow grazing or noshing plants. So things like cherry tomatoes, mulberries, blackberries, pomegranates, kumquats, even starfruit. Red mulberry, you can just pick these as you go. Delicious if you've never had red mulberry. We have some of these in Discovery Gardens. Pineapple, so easy to grow. What is it that's so easy to grow? A caveman can do it, that old commercial. But anyway, you just cut off the top, put it in the ground, and you all know it'll grow and it will produce for you. But what some people don't realize is that pineapple can take 18 months to produce a fruit. So, you know, I like to stagger them out when I plant them, but super easy. Passion fruit's actually super easy if you don't get the cold, um, you know, the, the freezing temperatures. And we're on that threshold. We usually get some frost and freezing temperatures each year and it hits our things back, but not too bad. Hey, Yard Brooke, about, yes. about 10 minutes. Okay. Alrighty. Oh, I got to show you all my favorite part of the presentation. Okay. So yard long beans. Um, Yard long beans are another really easy to grow vegetable that you can grow through the heat of the summer and they're so easy peasy. Uh, it's so easy to grow these. Harvest them when they're young. They're still pretty tough so you have to blanch them and prepare them appropriately but they are delicious. So those are just a few of the grazing or noshing plants that I could think of. Now I want to get to some naturalistic elements and I'll do this super quickly. Um, this is a big time trend that I am seeing here in our area and actually most of these pictures are going to be from the villages um, because I wanted to use it as an example of what you can do in a HOA situation with an architectural review committee, um, you know, in, in one of those typical situations. So anyhow, this is what folks are doing. They're incorporating more native plants. They're using lo local materials for hardscapes. They're adding snags, which are um, old trees uh, and logs. They're supporting wildlife, which is cool. And they're looking to nature for inspiration. So think about pruning your shrubs in cloud shapes or winding your paths in your yard and think of how a river, river or a stream winds. So anyway, just wanted to show you some examples. Actually, this one's from, the one on the left's from Winter Park. And this is just a little gravel pathway. And they have lots of cool flowering native and Florida friendly plants um, with lots of blooms. This one is on the edge of a house. And do you see the stark contrast? You have this little Florida native plant here and you have these stepping stones that are all irregular and very naturalistic. And then right next door is like this hard line, right? Of traditional landscape and more naturalistic landscape. So that you have, you're mimicking nature. You have winding paths. Um, some of your hardscapes might be fragmented or irregular. How about this? This is in the villages, you guys. Isn't this crazy? I feel like I'm in the Cala National Forest minus the <laughs> house in the background there or the golf course that's right next beside it. But I thought this was cool. This is dwarf altars by Burnham. We have saw palmetto and we have some maintained cherry laurel serving as a hedge. And they just went in with pine straw and white sand to wind their pathways. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, here's another yard that was very close. You can see the golf course in the background, but this was close to the other yard, but right, not right next to it. And they have some frog fruit. They have some saw palmetto. They have dwarf yopon holly, um, some different pines. Here it is just a little bit closer up. And I think they even have some beauty berry in the background there. So here was another yard in the villages too. Now this one was maybe even more wild, I guess you could say. They actually had a snag, which is an old tree stump that insects will use and break down uh, for food source. And then you'll get some birds in there. So birding was very important to this resident. She had this winding path with muley grass and um, blanket flower. So that was another thing that she had as well. And then you can see it's not purely uh, native plants. She has a shrub of, uh, it looks like pittosporum back here. And so anyhow, but I just think it's very interesting. 
here's a fallen log. Again, you need these insects to break down these um, pieces of wood so that they're present in your yard so that now you can bring in the birds and the other critters. And uh, they have crinum here and um, kunti palms as well. Here's another landscape. Uh, it looks like they have a dahoon holly. I uh, forgive me, I can't remember exactly what this ground cover name is in the front, but saw palmetto. They have limestone rocks. I have to tell you all, being from Tennessee, I was used to all these river stones. And when I moved down here, I thought limestone was so ugly. But after being in Florida for several years and seeing it and its natural elements, I now really adore limestone rocks. So anyhow, uh, plants are dripping everywhere in some of these yards too. So this is cross vine. You can see it up against the side of a house. So you know, just loads of plants is another trend. Look at this stark con contrast too between the yard on the left and the one on the right. I almost thought this was two different pictures that I took there, but no, that's that's just, you know, differences in neighbors. And here's another one with winding paths as well. And I see Wendy's on here, so I think I'm about to get kicked off. <laughs> but let me no, get to no, no. OK, let me get to the very end um, and then, you know, just incorporating some naturalistic structures. This is actually a metal structure, but you can see this delicate little, uh, I think maybe a coral honeysuckle growing up it too. So I did want to leave off, though, which I think we're going to mix it up a lot more. We're going to have a mix of natives, ornamentals, annuals and perennials. They're all going to be, you know, they're, these are all FFL plants or can be FFL plants. This picture is actually from Sumter County Extension and their demonstration garden. They have Simpson Stopper, a native. They have Weeping Yopon Holly, another native tree that gets red berries, and I love the weeping habit. They have um, Laura Petalum, a low-growing Laura Petalum. Then they have one of the sterile cultivars of Nandina, probably Bar Harbor or firepower. And then they have, it looks like maybe Vinca here, and then they have Kunti. So they have this mix of natives and non-natives. And I think we're going to see that more. And again, that's all FFL. Okay. So I think I have four minutes for questions. Ah, sorry guys. I just get too excited and I, I keep going. So. Okay, Brooke. Um, <clears throat> excellent job. I saw a lot of very nice comments. You, you've answered some questions. Um, <clears throat> such as you know what's the height of some of the plants like the twin flower um there was a comment i have i have had twin flower as my front yard lawn for the past eight to nine years Whoa. i live in orange county that was from uh orange county so the comment about frog fruit being a huge nectar source for small pollinators that was uh from alice smith um the Alice also mentioned sunshine mimosa uh, fixes nitrogen. Uh, Debbie Phillips had a question how to yeah. keep how to keep the ground covers out of flower beds. Oh, I have a, a comment to you all about the sunshine mimosa fixing nitrogen. I think it has to be inoculated with a certain bacteria in order to fix the nitrogen. I heard that from Jeff Norsini, who is a wildflower expert. He used to work for UF. Now I think he works for the Department of Transportation, possibly. So, and are, who knows if you're getting the inoculated sunshine mimosa. Anyway, just, yeah, so that was very interesting and new to me. I just heard that recently. All right, so keeping ground covers out of your flower beds. Oh, I am so glad you mentioned that because, you know, I talk, I rave about sunshine mimosa um, and I have it in my front yard and I made the mistake of letting it go into my flower beds and now I'm trying to rip it out and I'm digging very deep and I'm trying to root out all of the roots and it goes three feet deep sometimes. Um, and I know, <laughs> so anyway, because I have experience trying to trying to root it out. So I would say make sure you have a good barrier and just be on it as far as maybe once a month or once every two months um, going through and just edging it or cutting it with pruners just to keep it from growing in initially because you could end up being in my situation where I'm trying to pull it out like crazy and it's it's hard. OK, and we've got a, only a couple of minutes at, at most. So um, Marty Anderson asks, um, says he lives uh, where there's lots of live oaks and magnolias and constant issue with leaves. Are there any of the ground covers that can survive the leaves? Oh, probably not magnolia. I mean, I think you'd really have to rake that magnolia up. But, you know, the magnolias, you could rake, uh, this sounds kind of, but you could rake them up. 
um, and then chip them up with a lawnmower and they'll break down. But, you know, that's kind of a, it's, it's a laborious process, I guess you could say, to do that. I can't think of too much that would under, uh, that would withstand those large magnolia leaves, um, unless you just leave that area in a pine straw mulch. You know, you could do that too and not grow anything under it and just have a nice big pine straw area underneath it. It'd be a large bed, but anyhow, I'm, I'm interested in other solutions people have too. Well, there's lots of nice comments. I do want to mention this one. Essen Mamol um, had a, said that it's a great presentation. Remember, FFL promotes research-based info. If some of the plants do not have science-based info, then we cannot incorporate them into the FFL you know, program. Also includes both natives and non-natives as long as they are right plants for the right place. So Correct. I think folks you know, Master Gardeners, if you haven't visited and, and use this as a resource, the FFL program has lots of really nice resources that you can use and, and spread the word to lots of Floridians. Yeah, thank, thank you, Essen, for that comment. And, and there was a couple that I mentioned, the Desmodium, and then there was another one I mentioned that I thought, mm, you know, we don't really have much information, but it could be something potential and something that we could research. So there's lots to research in this area. Gosh, and it's one o'clock. So our that's central time, folks. You're at two o'clock in most of Florida, I guess, but great, great job there, um, Brooke. Thanks. And I can't figure out how to stop sharing. So hopefully you guys can help me out. I think we, uh, it's time to go to the next, your next you station. Can, you could just hit the leave button. Brooke and you'll be oh, okay. fine. And okay. then everybody else can also leave too and go to your next session. I know you can't see me. It's the voice of Wendy saying go hit the leave and go to your next session. Brooke Moffis, thank you so much. We appreciate your expertise. <laughs>